Hello, folks, and welcome to another Richard Head long, 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 bling, long, bling, 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 very long bows, very bling. long, bling, bong, bling, <laughs> a ling, long bows, ling, ling, bing, ding, ding, ding. Uh, oh, those Chinese bows. Those those those. <laughs> no, you don't want the Chinese, the Chinese virus bows. Um, no, this <laughs> this is uh, actually one of our Zoom meetings. Oh, uh, there's mum coming now. Huh? Oh. Mum's just coming back. Oh, we're going to start again, do we? No, 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 she's creeping around very quietly just to not disturb <laughs> the gravel. <laughs> right, I'll start again. Hello, right. everybody. And welcome to a Richard Head Long Ling Long 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 Ling Ling Long 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 Bows video, uh, which is actually a Zoom video because of all the goings on that are going on in the world. This is how we're doing videos at the moment. And that is actually a practice video. Richard, who's over there, is doing a talk. Or is he over there? I can never remember which way around it is with this. He's the guy in the purple. Um, is going to be doing a online talk using Zoom for a group, a private group, history type group. And uh, we just wanted to do a run through of the talk or seminar that he's going to do because it's going to involve technical things like pressing buttons, oh, bringing up God. photos on the screen, which is well beyond people who work with wood for a living. So that's why we're going to do this test. Anyway, I'll hand it over to you, Richard. What are you right, going to be doing? Okay. Yes, this could be a nightmare. I've only just got used to ballpoint pens. Uh, <laughs> yeah, since you got rid of the quill. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> this is a, a brief outline of how I got involved in archery and bow making, and will include then an overview of making the longbow from you. Um, I started archery in the 1960s and joined Bath Archers, shooting the modern bow then. Uh, Bath Archers was founded in 1857. And the great Horace Ford, who was one of the uh, Victorian archers who developed archery to be a bit more scientific. He actually lived in Bath and probably was a member of Bath Archers. And he's actually buried in a cemetery just on the outskirts of the, the city. Um, I was uh, saying purely modern bows. I was probably the, in the top three in the county and was part of the county team. Uh, so I was doing quite well, but then in 1972, I moved to Malawi in Africa, uh, working for the Malawi government. Uh, the president had decided he needed a new capital city, and you can do that sort of thing if you've made yourself a life president, but they needed uh, expertise uh, from architects, engineers, surveyors. I was a quantity surveyor, so um, he needed people like that out there to provide the expertise to do the, the building and produce uh, these magnificent government offices and everything that they built. Palaces. So you thought you'd work for a despot. Well done, Dad. Yes, I like them. Thanks, thanks for that. They're my favourite. <laughs> I like them. Anyway, um, so I took my bow out and made a target and did some practising when it was a bit cooler later in the day. I just kept shooting. And then I met another chap out there who also had a bow, which he'd made himself, but it was a, a composite modern materials bow. And he was keen on field shooting, which is shooting in woodland, so simulated hunting. But he was also interested in bow hunting. Uh, bow hunting was illegal in Malawi, although we did often see uh, local inhabitants walking along uh, trackways with bows and arrows, so they were obviously doing a bit of a quiet hunting on the side uh, so it was it was illegal but we did get permission to hunt hyena they were out killing local cattle and we got permission from ministry of agriculture to cull the uh, hyenas now if you've ever been close to a hyena they make pit bull terriers look like fluffy little kittens they are really powerful animals uh, so the plan was uh, to make some tree stands and a lot of the trees around there would like telegraph poles. Uh, so this chap who was uh, an agricultural engineer and, and worked on a research station and he was very clever. He produced a, a lot of um, useful uh, pieces of equipment for local farmers to increase their agricultural yields. Uh, but he welded up some seats, about a foot square piece of metal couple of supports, a chain round it, and what you did, you got a ladder and put this 10 foot up a tree and you sat on it. 
with your bow and arrow, hoping you didn't fall off. So the plan, there was us two, um, another chap who came along with a, a shotgun just in, in case we needed to frighten anything off. So we made the ladder, all these tree stands, got a sack full of condemned liver from the local abattoir. Keep you going while you're up there. Hey? To keep you going while you're up there. <laughs> yes, a bit of liver, a bit of condemned liver. Can't beat it. <laughs> you can cut the bits of bread. So anyway, we set off with a ladder, all these tree stands, bows, arrows, torches, because we had to do it at night. <laughs> um, condemned liver and, and set off. <laughs> Now, the only problem was they did manage to kill a lot of hyenas uh, by putting basically landmines in the footpaths. Uh, there were small landmines and they put some bait over them and the hyenas would trigger the mine. It would explode throwing uh, cyanide up into their faces and killing them. Lovely. And we did see quite a few dead hyenas. So when we went out, we had to be make, make sure we didn't tread on these landmines or get eaten by hyenas, which is another risk. So anyway, we went, went out, got, got up the ladders, put the tree stands up and sat there over this sack of condemned liver we put down on the ground and waited for the hyenas, who uh, never turned up, of course. <laughs> so we got, Eventually, we got fed up, left the condemned liver there for them to munch on later on, and made our way back. By then, it was dark, and we sort of got a little bit lost. <laughs> and we had to cross a crocodile infested river, walking on a fallen tree that had gone across it. Uh, managed to get to the other side without getting eaten by a crocodile. And this was carrying the ladder, the tree stands, the bows, and still. <laughs> Um, anyway, we couldn't find the car we'd come in, uh, so we wandered around and stumbled across a local village, which are ba were basically mud huts with grass roofs, and um, <laughs> asked, we, only, we didn't really speak the local language, but we did know that the oh, local word <laughs> for car was Galimoto, so we kept shouting Galimoto at them. And eventually they, they did, made one out of mud did, and sticks. <laughs> they did find our car for us. So that was the end of my uh, hunting career, which was pretty useless. Really. Anyway, on returning to the UK, uh, I rejoined Bath Archers and eventually the whole family were shooting. And hopefully you can now see a picture of yeah. us all. Me. Wow. Lindsay, my wife. Miranda, a daughter, and Philip. I don't know how old he was there. Probably. Five or six. Yeah, five or six, I suppose. Five, six. Um, all, all shooting. We did shoot uh, competitively, which was um, which was quite good. And by then, I became interested in the longbow. There were a number of tournaments just for longbows, and some of them involved dressing up in sort of a Victorian type costume, which all added to the. Uh, the fun and the overall appearance of the, sh the shooting line. Um, so I thought, well, there wasn't many longbows around at the time. There were very few people actually making them. You could get your hands on a Victorian bow if you were lucky, but they probably had a rather short lifespan. So coming from a family that if you needed something, why not make it? And my father made, after the war, a television set out of old army surplus spares, um, which worked, uh, but the screen was green. I think it was from some sort of radar stuff. And the, you know, I think you had to watch the picture as the thing circulated in. Uh, so that means I started making my own bows and, and was reasonably successful at it. And during Mrs. Thatcher's reign, I was made redundant. And by then I'd already built up quite a thriving part-time hobby come business making bows, but was already selling them to companies, uh, archery retailers over here, and also one in Germany. And I built on the contacts we had and was soon selling them to a company in America, 
uh, one in Paris, and uh, also contacted Harrods over here who were interested in uh, having our bows should anyone want them. So that became uh, a reasonable business, uh, building it, building it up. As part of the business, we also did demonstrations at various events, and this is one at uh, I think it was Chepstow Castle. Chepstow Castle, yeah. It was a it was a week of events at, at Chepstow Castle. It was a sunny. Uh, so as well as bow making, we did some have a go archery for the public as well. So that um, it just made things a bit more a bit more interesting. Uh, so another one there at a craft show, which we were again demonstrating the longbow, and people were very interested to see the bow, and um, you know we could we could talk about it. Uh, we were also featured at that time in various magazines, newspapers, and this was Good Woodworking magazine, who did a, a regular feature on people in their workshops. And obviously, the longbow was rather uh, interesting to them; never, never come across anyone making them before. So we featured in their magazine. And most people, most people associate the bow with the yew tree. And a lot of people think, oh, yew trees, yep, they were planted in churchyards so that in time of war you could nip out and cut a branch off and whittle a quick longbow from its branches. But that's not really correct. Most of the yew trees in churchyards were there prior to the Christian religion. The pagan religion looked upon the yew tree because it was an evergreen tree uh, with some sort of, um, had some mystic um, properties and they gathered around the yew tree to, they, you know, make um, their sort of religious rituals and all the rest of it. And when Christian religion came along, uh, they took along some of the trappings of the pagan religions so that everyone felt uh, still uh, comfortable with it. And yew trees were planted, or they built the churches really around where yew trees were and again if you wanted some trees in your and around your church you might as well pick something that was evergreen uh, throughout the year uh, so various trees uh, like that that is a yew tree you can see that nothing in there that would make a bow you need something that's reasonably smooth uh, not full of lumps and bumps and corrugation. So that's that's a tree that's uh, very, very old, as is this one, probably 500 years old. But they grow very twisted and gnarled, and it's difficult to find a decent piece of wood uh, within it. That's looking up into a tree at some of the branches. That's the same tree. That's the same tree, yep. yeah. Okay, so once you get underneath it and look up and some of those pieces might be suitable you need something six to nine inches diameter reasonably clear of all little side branches because that produces knots and pins within the wood making it difficult to make a, a bow from uh, that's another shot of the same thing and we've been out to uh, various areas in forests where there's been lots of yew trees and looked at them all and really there's been nothing suitable to make a, a good quality longbow. Yep, you could make a, a rough and ready bow if you were desperate, but not something that we would want to use to make a bow for a serious tournament shooting. This is a pile of wood we've got at home, and it's easier to find short lengths, and all these are about three foot six long. You can find a piece that that's length without being full of knots, uh, but you need to split it. And these, you can probably see there's some writing on it. Whenever we collected a piece of wood, we wrote where we got it from and, and a date. And some of this came from quite a few years ago during the hurricanes, which brought down a lot of yew trees. And we got some very good wood from near Stonehenge, from the prehistoric uh, burial mounds overlooking Stonehenge where it was chalky soil so the trees grew very very slowly and uh, very very tight grain and we managed to get some very good pieces of wood uh, from there. 
we have actually done a, a video on that wood in more detail which i'll put in the uh, description if people want to see that yeah okay that's fine good um of course we've got to split this wood up you can see some of it's already been split uh, and i found the easiest way and this is you know over quite a few years research i found the easiest way to split the wood um was actually to get your wife to do it for you and uh, here is a video of Lindsay splitting a log. This one was about as hard as iron, but she worked her way at it. You need A to start it off with an axe to start the split going, and then wedges and a hammer, and you keep whacking away, following the split as it goes down the wood and moving the wedges along. It made my mum do this in sandals. Come on, harder. It's harder. <laughs> and then eventually it splits. And oh, yeah. you've, then got, you've then got your two pieces. Uh, say this was a fairly scrap piece of wood, um, but you can see how it easily, it, roughly easily it splits. So once you've got it split, you need to take it into the workshop. Uh, and this is a picture of the workshop. Uh, slightly posed with bows and bits and pieces hanging around. Um, but this is where most of the work is now carried out. Uh, tools. We need tools to work bows. And this is a box of tools that we made for the Worship of Company of Bowyers. And you've got uh, a saw, a plane, an axe, and a lot of the initial work is done with an axe. Uh, you've then got a draw knife. This is quite a very simple draw knife. Uh, a spoke shave, again, an old wooden spoke shave. Uh, you've got a tool used for making the tapered hole in the horn, uh, and you've got a, a, a scraper. So that's, that's the box of tools that we made. Uh, this is me working with a particular tool, uh, similar to a float and on the Bowyer's, Worship Company of Bowyer's crest of arm, coat of arms, they've got a float. Theirs appears to be a wooden block with blades set into it, which presumably is one way of making it. This one is a, a modern version, but speaking to Hector Cole, he said, yes, you could have a piece of metal and make ridges in it. So it's like a, a, a modern sort of rasp. Uh, this is using the axe, or a picture of me using an axe, to get a lot of the rough wood off the stave to start with. So you use rather coarse tools to begin with, and then you work to finer tools. So the axe for a start, and this is another video uh, showing the axe being used, and on that stand are various bows in different uh, stages of production. Uh, so the video, will show me using the axe. And this was on London Bridge. I think it was the 800th anniversary of London Bridge, yeah. where we did a little demo with uh, Worship Company of Bowyers, and London Bridge was lined with various livery companies uh, showing their, their crafts. Uh, the axe, if you've got a nice sharp axe, will remove Wood down to the line, you can see I've marked a line on there. And the idea is to use the axe to get down to that line, quickly remo removing quite a lot of uh, coarse materials. So basically the tools we've got are an axe, a small axe so that you can use it quite precisely. 
So most of the rough wood is removed with the axe. You then move on to a draw knife held in both hands. And that will make just you take a little bit more wood off. So you're working a little bit finer. You then need a spoke shave and that will take very thin slices of wood off. So you're getting nearer to the shape of the bow. This one's got a, a curve in it, which is quite handy for working on the belly of the bow. Uh, these are the things that we're calling floats. Uh, you can see this sort of serrated edge. This is a modern one, but uh, a blacksmith could produce something like this. And it's a, a simple version of a, a rasp. Once you've got down to the very nearly what the bow shape will be, you can use a scraper to get some of the tool marks out. And this one has been shaped to a bow shape. So once we've got down to that, I'll show you a picture of see, me using a spoke shave. So the bow is held in a vise to keep it steady while you gently take wood away. This picture shows me using a bandsaw to remove some of the waste wood from a U stave, um, which is it's convenient to do. It speeds things up a bit. And uh, why not use modern uh, equipment nowadays? Now, one of the advantages of using U, and when you look at a piece of U, you'll see it's got a very distinctive pale colored sapwood, which is just below the bark. And you've got an orange colored heartwood. Now the sapwood uh, forms the outside curve of the bow because it's very, very good at resisting tension. So it stretches. And the heartwood is very good at resisting compression. Now a lot of modern longbows are laminated and they will use either hickory or bamboo instead of the sapwood to give that ten tension uh, properties. And a different hard heartwood um, generally, um, either lemon wood, uh, Osage orange, um, yew can be used. So um, a laminated production, whereas this self yew bow just has sapwood and hardwood. So you've got those two ideal properties in one wood. And along with its natural springiness, it's, it's an ideal wood if you can find something that's not full of knots. Where you've got a knot, and this is a fairly small pin knot, it's usual to raise the wood around the knot to strengthen it, to stop the wood actually fracturing at that particular place. This shows a joint, and you saw the short billets earlier on. You've got to joint them together to give you your six foot or six foot plus length of uh, material to give a stave. So it's usual to joint it. And that shows a joint. It's a double, double wedge shape in that particular one. We've got a variety of joints we can use from a simple single wedge like that. One that we normally use, which is a double like that. But each piece, when you cut them, the shape is identical. That makes, makes it easier to cut and that fits together. The one in the picture was a double, but as you can see, you've got two different shapes to produce, which makes it more complicated, but it does have a bigger glue area. So in theory would be slightly stronger. So once we've got that, we now need to move on to That, oh, that's a picture of the, the joint in the handle. So that handle is, the bow is finished actually. It's got the arrow plate in it. It looks nice and smooth. It's been sanded down and it still shows where the handle joint is. And that will be covered over by the handle covering. So you won't actually see that when the bow is finished. Uh, the important bit of making a bow, and we use the ax, we've used the draw knife, we use the spoke shave, we've got it down to the dimensions of a bow, it's nice and smooth, but it's not a bow until it's been tillered. And that is the process of bending the bow, getting the bow used to bending, 
and making sure both limbs bend evenly. And here is a video of a group of people. We have a small uh, bow making course running and they are now in the workshop. Whoops, gone the wrong way. Sorry, let's go back. They are in the workshop just about to start tillering the bows that they have been working on. And this is the point where it can all go horribly wrong and the bow actually break, but none of these did. So you've got a pulley and a long rope, which people are then pulling back, watching the curve. You've got to make sure both limbs are bending evenly. If they're not, you need to take a little bit more wood out of the stiffer limb, probably with the scraper. You don't want to take too much away. And as I mentioned earlier on, uh, these videos, we've, the clips that we're using here are from full videos, which I will put in the description box below if people want to watch the whole video. Yeah, so that was them tillering. So you can see the, the process there. You draw it very gently, uh, dozens of times, gradually extending the draw when you're confident both limbs are bending evenly until you're at full draw and you can then weigh the bow. It's better to make a bow and not worry about what the finished draw weight will be and get a, a, a good bow. A well-tillered bow will shoot better than a heavy bow that's really poorly tillered. So we've got the bow tillered. Although well, those already had the knocks on, which was a speed uh, when we were doing the course, you need to put knocks on the end. And they are made these days from water buffalo horn and this is how it starts off a piece like that which we then cut and shape to knocks and you can make them as plain or as fancy as you like uh, the end of the bow has to be tapered to a conical shape and the horn has a conical hole in it and the two go together and they're glued on with an epoxy glue so you can make them as like this one this is a top knock we've got the groove in it we drew a little hole in it for a length of cord which uh, goes around the string stops it coming off in the bag we've got some elaborate bows and these are from a part of the bill terry's uh, collection actually uh, so if you're artistically inclined and want to spend the time on it, you can make quite elaborate knocks, which these these are, these sort of bird head knocks. Very, very, very interesting. So you've got the knocks on. You now need to put a handle on the bow uh, and an arrow plate if you wish. Uh, this is, we usually put a piece of mother of pearl in and with a, a self view bow, the arrow passing the bow is likely up to, over time to wear a hole in the side of the bow, at least a groove in the side of the bow. And the mother of pearl being a lot harder material will stop that happening and gives it an attractive appearance. So that one has got a braid with some uh, fancy gold already in it. And I'm just putting this trim at the top, which is um, leather uh, embossed with, uh, with gold leaf. That's a handle complete, slightly different material, but a dark green traditional archery color, mother of pearl arrow plate, and then the gold leaf leather trim, top and bottom. That's three different uh, bows there, showing different materials for the arrow plates actually, and those are leather handles, but again, with the, uh, with the trim. So that completes the bow. You could obviously make a string for it, but that's, that's your bow complete now. And you can make the handle as fancy or as plain as you like. Or if you're making a medieval style bow, they probably wouldn't have even had a handle on them. We did a few commissions. Uh, this one is uh, in the V&A in London, or it was in the V&A. And it was the Sir Foster Cunliffe. And it was for the uh, umpteen hundred years uh, commemoration of the abolition of the slave trade and they commissioned uh, Yinka Shonabari who was a British Nigerian artist to come up with a figure and Sir Foster Cunliffe 
who was uh, born in 1682, died in 1758. He was one of the main slave traders in Liverpool. Uh, so he made his fortune out of the slave trade. Uh, but he did form the Society of British Bowmen. So he was a very, very keen archer. And uh, Yinkashong Abari, having been nominated for the Turner Prize, was asked to produce a figure of Sir Foster Cunliffe at play. So we had to make a bow that was permanently bent. Uh, we had to produce the arrows. And you can see Sir Foster Cunliffe is clothed in African batik print material. Uh, we had to fletch the arrow with the same material. Uh, we provided a quiver uh, of the period and we actually designed the figure. We didn't make the figure, model makers made it, but we actually designed the figure so that it looked natural shooting. And when we asked about um, whereabouts on his face he would be drawing the arrow to, we were told that the artist, one of his uh, trademarks is that he doesn't produce heads for any of his figures. Uh, so that threw us into a little bit of a quandary, uh, but we designed the whole thing. Uh, we didn't get any thanks for designing it. We did get paid for it, obviously, but uh, uh, there we are. The artist uh, came up with the idea and we produced the figure. And it looked pretty good, actually, when it was done. We're not sure where it is now. I think it went no. to Eric. I, I did, did try and look it up again. I've got a video of me uh, a very long time ago, so not very good quality footage of me going to, when it was in on display in London as it is in this picture, uh, to go and see it. It was part of a wider ex exhibition called the Uncomfortable Truths exhibition uh, about obviously slave, uh, slaves and slave trading. Um, so yeah, I'll put that video in the link below as well. Uh, so that was one. Uh, another one we did is this one, which was for, the Town Hall in Flantricent. Um, the Welsh archers who accompanied the Black, Black Prince to the Battle of Cressy, uh, because of their prowess on the battlefield with the long world, were granted freedom of the city of Flantricent, and we believe their descendants are also granted uh, the uh, freedom. Again, like the other one, we had to make a bow permanently bent to look as if it was in the action of shooting, and we produced the arrows and the arrow bag uh, we also tried our best to get the model maker to make a model that looked as if he was really serious about shooting, um, but uh, it didn't quite happen this time. Uh, but that's there, and again, quite a nice nice commission. Uh, we've currently got a commission for the Royal Logistical Corps Museum in Winchester. Again, it'll be an archer uh, standing with his, his longbow. Uh, don't quite know what that's doing there. It's not a commission, but it's interesting. <laughs> if anyone's fancied shooting like that, um, feel free. Uh, this is now the group we had over with us uh, making their own long bows. And this is just the finish of them shooting the bow. We had to shoot them to make sure they still worked. And that's the current master of the Wishful Company bow we are shooting. And a nice aerial shot of them shooting, and this is over at Hector Cole's workshop. So that concludes my talk. So uh, I hope you found something interesting amongst it and didn't fall asleep halfway through. Um, so that's it. Great. Hey, well done. I think you did very well, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, oh God, what pictures next? What have I written down? <laughs> uh, well, I'm sure everyone, everyone find that very interesting. Thank you very much for watching, everybody. Um, I'm sure the talk proper will go down very well with the people that their dad's doing this talk for. Uh, as I say, any of those videos that in their complete form that I mentioned within this, I will put in the description box below. And if you'd like to join us for more Zoom meetings and various other silliness and videos that we do on bow making, what have you, then please do feel free to subscribe and give us a like and comment below. Thank you very much for watching and we'll see you again soon.
I think it went all right, Dad, didn't it? I don't know. You were listening. <laughs> <laughs> 